Good morning, everybody. I would like to welcome you back to the new, um, to the new year, and uh, I appreciate you joining us again with this webinar series on managing drought in Southern Plains. Uh, I'm Mark Schaefer with the Oklahoma Climate Survey and Southern Climate Impacts Planning Program. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Margaret Brune, SKIP Program Manager, is managing the webinar. The, the format of today's webinar will be slightly different. We will begin with summaries from several of the region's state climate offices. Uh, 2011 was a year of extremes and their experience and insights will set the stage for what follows. Presenters include John Nielsen Gammon representing Texas, Gary McManus representing Oklahoma, Mary Knapp representing Kansas, Pat Ganan representing Missouri, and Nolan Duskin representing Colorado. Dave Dubois from New Mexico unfortunately cannot join us because ironically he is attending a drought meeting in Arizona. Each presenter will give a brief recap of 2011 and where we stand today. Mark Svoboda from the National Drought Mitigation Center will follow that with the drought update and outlook. Our focus topic will be seasonal forecasting, where we will be joined by Dennis Tody from the American mm -hmm. Association of State Climatologists, John Gottschalk from NOAA's Climate Prediction Center, and Holly Hartman from CLEMIS, the Climate Assessment for the Southwest, our counterpart research team in New Mexico and Arizona. I would also like to recognize the support of those who've made this webinar series possible. Chad McNutt with the National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS, David Brown, NOAA Regional Climate Services Director for the Southern Region, in my case, with the National Drought Mitigation Center. I also appreciate those of you who took your time to respond to our survey. We will distribute a summary soon, but it was apparent mm -hmm. that many of you have found these quite useful. If you've not yet responded to the survey, we would love to hear from you. Your voice is very important to all of us. These webinars are an ongoing series that will occur on the second and fourth uh, Thursdays of each month. We will not hold uh, January 26th webinar due to the American Meteorological Society's annual meeting, and, may be, and many presenters are unavailable at that time. Our next webinar will be on February 9th with topics still to be determined. These webinars are designed to improve communication across our region to help those agencies and organizations that are managing aspects of drought. Your interests and needs are important to us. We encourage you to help us select presentation topics, either through the online poll that you see on your screen, through the chat box, or by emailing or calling Skip. Mm -hmm. Each webinar includes an update from the Drought Monitor authors and state climatologists. Each will have a discussion topic based on the topics of greatest interest as indicated by the poll subject to the availability of presenters. We welcome suggestions on presenters as well as topics. You may ask questions or comments at, or make comments at any time through typing in your chat box. Each webinar is recorded and posted on the SKIP YouTube channel. The PowerPoint slides are posted on the NIDIS drought portal, drought.gov, in the Southern Plains section. A two-page PDF summary will be prepared following the webinar and will be available next week on the NIDIS portal, SKIP website, SKIP Facebook page. We will put up a list of resources, including these links again at the end of the presentation. I will now turn it over to our state climatologists or the representatives, beginning with John Nielsen Gammon from the Texas Office of the State Climatologist. He will be followed by Gary McManus from Oklahoma, Mary Knapp from Kansas, Pat Ganan from Missouri, and Nolan Duskin from Colorado. Thank you, Mark. Um, Texas, uh, of course, uh, had its worst uh, one year drought on record um, based on my assessment, the precipitation, we set the record for the uh, smallest uh, 12 month total statewide. Uh, we had a total of two months with above normal rainfall during 2011, which includes December. The fall was actually pretty close to normal rainfall, uh, which has people thinking, but is the drought over or um, getting better? And uh, the normal progression for recovery from drought is uh, the soil starts getting wetter and moister, and then eventually you get more runoff, and then the reservoirs start recovering. At this point, in general, across the state, our reservoirs are up from uh, their minimum values in November, but are still way below uh, normal levels. So the drought is definitely ongoing. Uh, furthermore, the outlooks for the uh, rest of the winter indicate uh, likely below normal rainfall with the La Nina. So uh, uh, at this point, uh, we recovered from having most of the state being in exceptional drought status, according to the drought monitor, um, with the improvements being uh, greatest in the uh, Texas Panhandle and uh, in uh, um, uh, north uh, north central Texas. And uh, perversely, 
Uh, Midland uh, has uh, already set its uh, seasonal record for a total snowfall, um, which uh, water equivalent is comparable to what they received during the first 11 months of 2011. So it's, uh, it, it, it'd be nice to get some of that in liquid form before it evaporates. Um, Gary, what's the situation in Oklahoma? Thanks, John. And we certainly had a, an eventful year in 2011 in Oklahoma, just like everybody else across the, the country. Um, we did have a lot go on as far as the all-time records, so let, let's get right into that. Um, well, it, this is something we've gotten a little bit used to in Oklahoma with the, the most FEMA declared disasters in the United States since the year 2000. So extreme weather is becoming part of our norm. Uh, but we certainly would like a, a break in, in 2012. Okay, next slide. Um, well, first, we have the snowstorms uh, that we had earlier uh, in, in the, the winter season. The first uh, storm we had was January 29th and 31st. And that was actual blizzard. We had up to 21 inches of snow in parts of Oklahoma with the general snowfall of 6 to 12 inches and 50 mile per hour winds, creating, uh, uh, causing a lot of havoc across the state. Uh, the second snowstorm we had, we, we actually set our all-time state record 24-hour snowfall uh, in the town of Spavanon, northeast Oklahoma, with 27 inches. And that was broken just a couple of years ago in March of 2009 in northwest Oklahoma with 26 inches. So we've, we've gotten a little bit of string of uh, heavier snowfall occurring here recently. Uh, and then in, to the end of the year, we had the, the, the Panhandle blizzard with uh, up to 15 inches of snow in the far western Oklahoma Panhandle and drifts of up to 10 feet. Okay, next slide. To go along with our snow back in February, we also set our lowest temperature ever recorded in Oklahoma. Uh, minus 31 degrees was recorded at Nowata, the Mesonet site up there in northeast Oklahoma. And we didn't just barely top that previous record of minus 27 degrees, we uh, shared it by four degrees. So uh, that that cold weather from uh, late January through early, early February was certainly a, a, a record setting uh, uh, cold snap here in Oklahoma. Next slide. Tornadoes, we had our share of tornadoes. Uh, the most tornadoes ever in one year for Oklahoma, dating back to 1950 when accurate statistics began, is 145 in 1999. Uh, the, the preliminary total right now is for 118 in Oklahoma, and that's the second most on record. Uh, we also set a record for uh, tornadoes in April. We had 50. Uh, the old record is 40. What's odd about those 50 tornadoes is every single one of those tornadoes occurred east of I-35. So while West Oklahoma was mired in drought, East Oklahoma was getting relief, uh, but they were also getting severe weather. The 14 tornado deaths were the most since 1999 when we had 42. And uh, we also had 10 uh, tornadoes in November, uh, the second highest total next to 1958 12. And one of those tornadoes was an EF4 tornado, which is the strongest November tornado on record. So uh, we had an EF5 tornado strike uh, near, near El Reno. It hit our El Reno mezzanine side, actually. Uh, we recorded a surface wind of 151 miles per hour. That's the highest uh, Oklahoma surface wind ever recorded by uh, an in situ me a measurement uh, device. And we did get that certified with NCDC as the, the highest wind speed, surface wind speed ever recorded in Oklahoma. Next slide. We had. Uh, Another severe weather record, uh, we had a, a hailstone that fell near Goaty Bow on May 23rd. That was six inches in diameter, so that tops our previous record. So another all-time record uh, for Oklahoma. We also had, uh, in association with the drought and heat in this summer, we had the hottest month in Oklahoma ever with 89.3 degrees. Now, not only was that the hottest month in Oklahoma, it's actually the hottest uh, month statewide average uh, for any state in the United States, dating back to 1895. So, again, not only did we barely top that previous record of 88.1, we uh, shared it by 1.2 degrees. But now, to go along with the hottest July, we also had the hottest summer on record for any state, barely topping Texas um, by a tenth of a degree. Uh, so, uh, a record-setting summer in Oklahoma, as it was over much of the Great Plains or the, the, the Southern Plains. Another heat record, days above 100 degrees, that record was also smashed. The previous record was 86 days from Hollis in 1956. Uh, you can see down in southwest Oklahoma, our station, Messonet Station at Granfield reached 101 degrees. Um, so that's the new all-time state record. And many of those stations down there uh, topped that previous state record. And many of the stations in western Oklahoma 
top the locality or the, the local records for each uh, uh, area. Uh, well, of course, we know that about the drought. The drought began in October 2010. We had relief in East Oklahoma with the, the severe weather in April and May of 2011. They came completely out of drought. Uh, the drought came quickly back with the return of the heat, though, in the summer. The drought peaked in September with 93% of the state covered by uh, D3, D4, extreme to exceptional drought. It was the driest water year from October 2010 to September 2011 on record for uh, all of Western Oklahoma. Uh, 2011 ended with the 11th driest uh, ranking on record for the statewide average. Uh, that drought did cause an estimated $1.6 to $2 million in ag agricultural damage alone. We did get relief from that drought, however, from October through December. Uh, that included the 12th wettest November on record for Oklahoma and also the ninth wettest November-December period on record. And currently we have the, the latest, we can see the drought map at the, the, the peak time back in September with uh, most of uh, the western two-thirds of the state covered by that uh, exceptional drought. Uh, and this is uh, what we have, next slide please. Uh, this is a little a week old, but we'll see the, the newest map and it hasn't changed much. Um, we do have uh, that relief showing up in the, the eastern half of the state. Still, western Oklahoma is the worst hit area for Oklahoma, uh, including the Oklahoma Panhandle, where Hooker, um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, Hooker had the lowest record total, uh, annual total, uh, for any for any year in Oklahoma was 6.2 inches, which breaks the old record of 6.5 inches set back in 1956 for rain year in the Oklahoma. And of course, during this uh, year of 2011, we also had our strongest earthquake on record. Um, that's not a climate or weather related, but it's still a big disaster related uh, record for Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. And if uh, you want to reach us about any of this information, you can uh, call that number or, or email us at the uh, Oklahoma Climate Center. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Mary. Is, is Mary on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. You, you can hear me. Um, in Kansas, we kind of were on the edge of, of all of the major disasters. Uh, we in, uh, saw in southwestern and south central Kansas similar conditions as was in Oklahoma with a number of locations setting their all-time record for days above 100, particularly, again, in the Dodge City, Elkhart, Medicine Lodge area. Um, of note is that we had the relief in November and December with moisture. Southwestern Kansas had their um, fifth wettest December on record, but even with that moisture, they still ended up as being the fourth driest year on record. So while it made some relief, it uh, did not completely, by any means, um, change the, the picture. And we're actually beginning to see um, the more severe drought conditions expand their way westward again. On the other side of the coin, we had quite a bit of disaster-related uh, activities along the northern and eastern areas with flooding along the Missouri River that extended into October uh, before the rivers um, were back into their normal channels. So it's been a um, both sides of the coin. We did see fewer tornadoes than average, but again, that is hand in glove with the reduced precipitation. If you don't have moisture, you're not going to have much in the way of the severe weather. And that's basically what uh, we're seeing in Kansas. One thing we're looking for or watching out for is the potential for um, wildfires as we move into our spring season. Um, we're seeing increasing frequency of red flag days. Uh, we have some out today. And that we expect that trend to continue as we um, don't see any major moisture systems uh, changing the picture until spring. Hey, uh, Pat from Missouri, uh, see how things are going over there. Thanks, Mark. Good morning. I I have one slide up on the on the drive, but. Uh, it, definitely, I'm glad 2011 is over. It was quite an eventful year across the state, and I've put the most notable events that occurred here in the state. I'll go through them um, briefly. Um, early in the year, in February, um, 
it, what has been coined as a Groundhog Day blizzard on February 1st and 2nd. We had uh, a historic blizzard impact the state. In fact, it was some communities it was the first time officially a blizzard warning was issued for some counties in Missouri. Uh, one to nearly two feet of snow. We actually almost broke the state, state record in Warrensburg, Missouri. They reported 23 inches within a 24-hour period, one inch shy of the record that was established in Cape Girardeau back in 1978. Uh, in the spring, we had some um, extensive flooding across southeast Missouri. Southeast Missouri did see the wettest April on record. Some communities picked up anywhere from 15 to 20 inches of rain during the month of April. And of course, uh, we have saw some record flooding along the Ohio and the um, Mississippi River, especially south of Cape Girardeau. Some communities established record crests south of Cape Girardeau all the way down to New Orleans with the historic flood that flooded thousands of acres of uh, river bottom land across southeastern portions of the state. In April, the, we had a historic tornado impact the St. Louis area. In fact, it was uh, categorized as an EF4 tornado the strongest tornado to hit St. Louis in over 40 years. A Lambert Airport was struck by this tornado and, and incurred significant damage. It was the first time that they actually had to shut down Lambert Airport because of the tornado for an extended period of time. Of course, in May, we had the historic uh, Joplin tornado. It was a, uh, for Missouri, it was categorized as one of the, the worst tornadoes on record. They had to say, in fact, it was Missouri's deadliest tornado. And, it's, and it became Missouri's costliest natural disaster ever. Uh, some of the uh, insurance estimates are running at about $2.2 billion in regard to the damage that occurred in the Joplin area. And it was only the second time since 1930 that Missouri uh, reached an F5 or EF5 designation with tornadoes. Of course, we had 161 fatalities, and it was the seventh deadliest U.S. tornado and the deadliest tornado in the country in more than 50 years. And uh, as we ro rolled our way into the summertime, we actually had uh, both scenarios of a historic heat wave and drought as well as a, as a flood. Started in May, we had some record discharges that were occurring up in reservoirs up in the Dakotas and Montana that led to some historic flooding along the Missouri River. Northwest Missouri was, was hit especially hard and actually broke some communities, broke some records in regards to the 90, 1993 flood. And we saw several overtopped uh, levees, uh, some breach levees, communities that were flooded, and of course a lot of uh, damage in regard to agriculture land that was flooded by this uh, flood that literally lasted throughout the entire summer. Also in the summer, we had the, the of course, the drought and heat wave impacting Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma began to nose itself up into southwest Missouri. And it turned out when the summer came to an end, it was our hottest uh, summer since 1980, more than 30 years. And we saw some, some incredibly bad conditions in regard to uh, agriculture that was impacted across southwestern Missouri. So those are the most notable events. A little bit more benign situation as we rolled away into the fall. And towards the end of the year, of course, October was a good month. It was dry, provided good harvesting opportunities across the state. November and December, we had above normal precip, which actually mitigated the drought condition across western and southern Missouri. And some very wet conditions across southeastern Missouri in November and December. It was the wettest uh, November, December period since uh, 1957. And I think I'll pass the baton to Nolan in, in Colorado. Thank you. Next slide. Just one slide here to show. I want to give you a little bit of a walkthrough of what happened in a, from a drought perspective in Colorado. As we, the upper left-hand corner there shows where we stood on approximately this date a year ago. Uh, and keep in mind that we have a spine of high mountains that run right up and down through the, through the state. And you know, the dividing line a year ago was exactly the crest of the mountain. Mountains picking up abundant moisture, but on the lee side, the downwind side, we had a very dry winter for most of the entire state of eastern Colorado. And in fact, from an agricultural point of view, dry land ag was looking bad as we went into the spring of 2011. Irrigated agriculture, taking water from the melting snow, looked very good. Fortunately, go so now to the upper right-hand corner, we had a series of spring and early summer storms that totally mitigated the developing drought over northeastern Colorado. In fact, we had excessive 
uh, high flows, uh, not damaging in many ways, but just large volume flows on most rivers coming out of the northern and central Rockies flowing either, or in Colorado, flowing either west or east. However, we had this strengthening gradient between the storm track passing across northern Colorado and leaving south and southeast Colorado in the, in the dry. And in fact, we did for several months uh, experience extreme uh, exceptional drought conditions to extreme drought conditions over quite a bit of the Arkansas Valley and the upper Rio Grande in south central Colorado. Now as we've gone through this fall and early winter, fortunately some of those storms that have hit the south, uh, New Mexico in particular, have also benefited southeastern Colorado and you'll see the improvements that we've uh, experienced and we're very grateful for. In fact, that same area that was the driest uh, some months ago has now had the best moisture so far for this uh, uh, three and a half months into the new water year. At the same time, the areas that had the most generous moisture this time last year are drying out quickly in our northern and central mountains. So you'll see that just in the last couple of weeks, we've been introducing uh, abnormally dry conditions to the U.S. Drought Monitor depiction for North Central and Northwest Colorado, and it's expanding each and every week uh, so that we're, again, and as we often are on dividing line, sometimes the Northwest dividing line, sometimes in East, uh, sometimes North-South, sometimes East-West, but that we're often dealing with drought in one part of the state and not in another. We're glad that overall our reservoirs and surface water supplies are, are pretty good. Soil moisture remain somewhat marginal, but with considerable improvement in southeast Colorado, just getting worse over the northern part of the state. Thanks. All right. I'd like to thank our state climatologists for a very interesting look at the wide range of extreme events we've seen. Uh, we'll now return to our, our focus topic of, of, well, the drought summary with Mark Sapota from the National Drought Mitigation Center. He'll be followed by Dennis Toady, president of the American Association of State Climatologists and South Dakota State Climatologists. John Gottschalk, head of forecast operations with NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. And Holly Hartman, director of the Aired Lands Information Center with CLEMIS. So turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Mark. Good day, everybody. Just want to give you a, a brief update here of where we are going into the new year. Uh, the first slide here shows the drought monitor and just wanted to bring to your attention a uh, recent change in the depiction of the drought monitor and that we're using new labels. As you'll notice throughout the map, the letter S and L. Uh, and I think it's really kind of helped this year already in particular, given the dryness of winter conditions and the lack of snow, we're seeing a lot more concern for fire in many regions of the plains. Um, and that has come in handy when it comes to showing you have drought in the winter in this region, particularly in the northern plains, uh, but also in the southern plains. So we've been getting a lot of calls about the lack of snow in the upper Midwest, for example. You'll notice that we have S's uh, throughout that region where we show some severe drought, southern Minnesota, northern Iowa, et cetera. But focusing in on this region, if we can go to the next slide and, and zoom in on sort of the region at play here today, uh, you'll notice the real spotty nature of the recovery so far. And as, as John mentioned up front, uh, there's sort of a lag in recovering from drought. So if you look at the table, uh, I draw your attention to where we've seen the most notable changes have been on the most severe categories is what you would expect because we've got to chip away at this thing and, and knock down the D3 and D4 before we can really start to, to concern ourselves with is this drought over because by no means is this drought over. But you'll notice the largest uh, amounts of recovery like between say D3 and D4 we've seen a 30% to 25% improvement over just three months ago. So the new water year that began in October, uh, in that three-month period uh, through this week's map, we've seen some pretty notable improvements uh, across the region as a whole, <clears throat> in particular north central, northeastern uh, Texas, parts of eastern Oklahoma, and a good portion of Louisiana as well. Although you'll see a lot of D3 and D4 remaining. Next slide. What's it look like in the next five days? Well, uh, this pretty good system is going to slam into the northeast and leave us sort of high and dry. Not a lot of precip in the forecast except for 
uh, potentially over parts of eastern Texas and, uh, and Louisiana, Arkansas. Uh, but the story is then, after this little brief cold snap we've been in here the last couple days, we expect that to warm right back up. And you'll notice in the bottom left uh, that our temperatures are going to rebound quite well and be above normal over most of the southern and central plains. Next slide. Going out a little bit farther, hey, we're thinking spring. I think spring was mentioned already by, by Mary, and she's right. Uh, pretty soon it's going to be February. And looking at the rest of January certainly would show in the 8 to 14 day outlook uh, increased odds, quite increased odds of, of above normal uh, precipitation, or excuse me, temperatures. And uh, coupled, unfortunately, though, with a better odds of below normal precipitation. So again, that's not the best combination when you look at temperatures that will be likely above normal, coupled with precipitation that will likely be below normal. Again, that's, that's that traditional uh, La Nina flow there you're seeing across the southeast, not just the southern plains, but which could lead to a bridging back of those two droughts, one epicenter in the southeast centered over Georgia, and the other centered over uh, the southern plains that we're talking about here today. Next slide. Going out a little bit farther now, looking at the seasonal forecast for the next 90 days. Uh, echoing the January outlook there that you can see on the top two, but focusing on the bottom where we have the two red circles, we see uh, again looking at the January through March time frame, taking us through spring, greater increased odds of above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation. So not again the best of combinations. Uh, again showing that pretty good uh, increased odds over into Florida even uh, when it comes to precipitation being below normal. And actually, if you look at the next 12 months, or, or well, actually the next six to eight months out, the temperature signal is pretty persistent out through the rest of summer for this region, and the precipitation uh, is pretty persistent through the early, uh, the early summer, late spring period, again, uh, when we expect La Nina to decay. Next slide. So this would make sense when looking at the seasonal drought outlook, because we see we see a lot of the red there for persistence, but we also see some yellow on those fringe areas that would show that, based on the seasonal forecast we just looked at, uh, would seem to, to uh, predict that things are going to sort of fill back in, even though we've had some recovery here, very welcome recovery, uh, what could, could have been much worse as far as the precipitation side of things thus far in the southern plains has been uh, at least uh, adequate in some areas. And that's leading to this, this forecast, unfortunately, that builds it in all the way from northern California all the way around up into the Mid-Atlantic and the Carolinas. Next slide. So based on the topic today that Dennis is going to talk about, I thought I would just, uh, Dennis and John as well, I thought I would just sort of focus in on some other tools and resources that you can find using NIDIS portal, uh, drought.gov or, or Google NIDIS portal. We get asked the question a lot. In fact, that was the basis for developing the one, sort of the squaring house of a portal was, what's the current drought? Where are the impacts for drought occurring? Or how do they impact me? And is it going to get better or is it going to get worse? Next slide. So on the portal, if you click for me one more time, you'll notice at the top there's tabs. And the forecasting tab is the one we'll focus on today. Next slide. Um, when you come to the forecast home, the seasonal drought outlook uh, produced by the Climate Prediction Center is front and center. And we'll go to the next slide. And on the left is a navigation menu that shows us what's located within the forecast section, as well as any of the other tabs along the top. The next slide will show us our temperature and precipitation products that we're, we're highlighting. And if there's others that you would like to see us uh, feature, please email myself or Mike Brewer, Mike Brewer uh, at, at NOAA.gov, um, and we'll get those added. So here we're just focusing in on things uh, that we see based on seasonal temperature, longer term, 90 day, we also have uh, products in there from IRI, for example, in addition to the Climate Prediction Center, as well as the blue one in the middle that highlights everything from the, the next 12 hours all the way out to the next 90 days to, to 15 months. The next slide focuses in on more of our soil moisture-based products uh, that are a combination of what might the projected Palmer Drought Index look like. Also brings into play some of the newer stuff on the uh, ensemble as well as standalone LDAS products at the very bottom there that you'll see, and a lot of others in between. Uh, moving to the next one on hydrology, now we're getting a little bit into, and they've, they've hit the streets, or just about ready to hit the streets, NRCS with USDA in cooperation with the Weather Service uh, and the River Forecast Centers, 
are issuing both their snowpack and their streamflow uh, projected summer forecast for streamflow uh, through NRCS and, and the RFCs. And speaking of the RFCs, the middle product there through the AHAP system also has a lot of nice products that are generated by the river forecast centers within the weather service. Um, and then the bottom one there is looking at um, sort of a regional look at some of the work done at the University of Washington. Okay, last slide then will be focused on wildfire. And as we've heard this winter, this has been a pretty uh, dominant feature uh, when it comes to impacts uh, or early impacts that we're seeing now. And that's fire. And there's a lot of good products out there that are done uh, by both USDA, Forest Service, the Weather Service, as well as the National Interagency Coordination Center for Fire in Boise. Um, and so all of these are nice resources if you want to kind of know where are the fires occurring, what are the forecasts for those to persist or to maybe have an outbreak of, of fire. So with that, I'll wrap it up and turn it over to uh, our next speaker. Thank you. OK, uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. OK, great. Uh, I'm Dennis Toddy. I'm the South Dakota State Climatologist and also president of the American Association of State Climatologists. And I, uh, Mark asked me to, to dive in a little bit on interpreting the Climate Prediction Center outlook. Um, uh, Mark used those several times and pointed out to those and that there'll be a follow-up uh, from CPC and, and talking about the outlook. But we, we asked me to dive into these a little bit more to help you understand or interpret um, a little bit more beyond, I think everybody understands the green areas being, you know, say, uh, wetter than average and brown areas drier than average. But what do those really mean and how can you interpret those from an individual location? Let's go to the next slide. And the idea of what we're trying to get at here is, is partially what is a normal or, you know, in, in, in uh, meteorological parlance, normal is used, uh, but climatologists often use average instead. When you're comparing what to some sort of average. Uh, what averages are for us is a 30-year average that is updated every 10 years, and there are a number of different av uh, averages or normals that are used for uh, uh, temperature, precipitation, and over days, months, years. Go ahead to the next slide. But when you need to look at that, you need to understand that an average is, uh, and go ahead and fill in the rest of the slide with the other pieces here, um, that there is a, a lot of variability to it. An average is a, is a central tendency of this distribution. And we're talking about a larger distribution of data. So that the, the normal is, is, a, is an average, but there's a lot more variability that is involved here. This is data for Oklahoma City for the 71 to 2000 period. Um, go on to the next slide, please. Um, so, uh, you know, here's another set of, of those averages. Uh, September rainfall, September temperature, et cetera. Go ahead and to the next one. But, you know, whereas we often compare to an average, that doesn't get at that idea of variability. It's not supposed to rain that much during September. Does it usually rain that much? In fact, it's never done exactly that part uh, for Oklahoma City data banks dating back to 1896. It is just giving some description of that distribution. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, okay, so, you know, Oklahoma and the state in the area we're talking about here, and most of the plain states have highly variable conditions, so that the central tendency is not always a good measure of exactly what's going to happen. So we need to understand more about that variability, and we need to understand that variability when we're interpreting the Climate Prediction Center outcome. Next slide, please. Today we're going to give you an example of understanding how, how these are broken down among the Climate Prediction Center. Um, everyone, I think, understands that normal cannot be used as a single value. But what is considered normal for an area is, is a set of data in the middle of a distribution uh, that is near that average value. Here I'm giving you an example of, of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and we'll be up for January average temperatures. And now I've moved the current 30-year period from 81 to 2010. And the, the, the numbers on the left are a number of years that are in that category, and across the bottom give the categories of from uh, one year that was uh, the average temperature was less than 6 degrees, and the highest one was greater than 30 degrees in that, in that month. 
But you can see, obviously, where the middle of that distribution is, the most common numbers are in that mid-teens area. Okay, go ahead and hit the next slide. But when when you break this down, you can ask people, and there's a little bit different, you know, different opinion based on, on who you're talking to. But when you're looking at the Climate Prediction Center, what the Climate Prediction Center describes is that um, the middle breaks break this down, this distribution down into thirds. Uh, the top third is considered above average. The, the middle third of the data uh, are are considered near normal or near average. And then the bottom third is considered below average. Uh, and, and the cutoffs here are shown by those two lines. But the cutoff uh, for the bottom third is at 14 degrees Fahrenheit, and the cutoff for the top third is at 19.1 degrees Fahrenheit. So for each of the individual stations that is used, there's a specific cutoff that is used to break these thirds down. Okay? These are important because when the Climate Prediction Center does their outlook, they load the distributions or say, we have uh, enough information to say we have, there's an increased likelihood of conditions being above average. And what does above average mean? It means in this case that we have a, an increased chance or thinking the probability will be higher that uh, temperatures will be above uh, that 19.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Or in some cases they may say that we have better information, say during a La Nina year, that there's a better chance of it being below the 14 degree Fahrenheit. So that we, you're kind of loading the dice in this case, that we, 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 have, a, we have ideas that will be fit in one of these categories more than, more than the other one. Uh, once in a while, not often used, they, they say that there's a better chance of it being in the near normal category. That's a fairly infrequent, but not as much. Let's go on to the next slide. And again, reiterating what that means is that um, when it fits into these categories, that if you're in the bottom third of the distribution, and it's third, below normal, middle third, near normal, uh, top third, above normal. So when you're talking about those categories, increased chance of above normal means you have a better chance of fitting into uh, that, that top third category or the bottom third. Okay, uh, did we get that next slide in with the, okay. Um, so when you interpret these, uh, when, you, when you see these outlooks, um, again, the top A above, B below, N near normal, or the EC equal chances, basically equal chances doesn't say it's going to be near normal, it's that we don't have guidance that can say uh, we have any chance of being um, any better probability above or below. So it's equal chances of falling into any one of those distributions. So we don't have any skill at that point is basically what it's thinking. Or A or, or B indicates the forecaster thinks conditions will be a below or above normal. And then, uh, then contours show that the confidence of whether that forecast is going to stay. So it kind of shows up in the, in the distribution at the bottom that when it says equal chances, all three categories are equally probable. Or if you have a 40% category, say in the above, you have a 40% chance of being above, 32% chance of being near normal, or a 26% chance of being below. Or, you know, basically, you load the distribution one way or the other. Let's go ahead to the next slide. And those show up, those show up in the maps. When, when the maps show up, they give you a number on there, a number contour showing what the, what the chances are of being in these different categories. So what you have to understand is when those categories show up, say that's 40 over an area, that's 40% chance of being above, 32% chance of being near, and then the 26% chance of being below. So that's how you kind of have to adapt those. Um, those all outlooks are, are presented from uh, what is, you know, from eight, six, ten day, eight to fourteen day, monthly, and then ninety day ones. They're done for for each month. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, three month outlooks and one month outlooks and the three month outlooks they go out to a year in advance. And again, the the darker shading, more confident a forecaster is that. Uh, one category uh, has, has a better chance of occurring. The only thing to remember is, again, we're, we're, it's kind of like we're loading the dice. We're not saying it's going to fall in this category. It's just a better chance of falling in that category. So you have to make decisions based on that, on that uh, guidance. Uh, it, is, it is not often that the probabilities are loaded very high. 
we did see some probabilities in the, I'd say the 6 to 10 day, the 8 to 14 day temperature outlooks of March show that have very high probabilities of being warmer than average or colder than average. Um, that, that possibility is, is what's going to go on. And then the other thing that to, to remember is, is in your area, make sure you understand where those cutoffs are, what those numbers are. Our information center does have these cutoffs on their website so you know those specific categories that you're looking at because they do differ from site to site. And I think that's my last slide. And go on. Okay. That's, uh, I didn't get a slide in there of my contact information, but uh, Mark and the folks down there have my contact information and can uh, ask you on the news any questions you have. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, I'll go ahead and get started on my section. Um, as it says there, my name is uh, John Gottschalk, and I'm affiliated with uh, NOAA's Science Prediction Center. And today I'm mainly going to be talking about just what goes into making the seasonal outlook that Dennis did a very nice job of uh, explaining the interpretation for. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, this is the outline of what I plan to discuss uh, today. And four sections, uh, each one will have to be touched on relatively briefly given the time. But the first one will be just a description of the launch schedule and, the, and our forecast process in general, just to make sure everyone's on the same page when these outlooks are produced. Uh, we'll go into some detail on what's the scientific basis for, for doing seasonal forecasts and some of the forecast tools. Um, briefly touch on an example forecast challenge and making seasonal outlooks, and then wrap up with a, a very quick review on where we have the best uh, accuracy or forecast skill or more the most confidence in our outlook. Um, as the last slide. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, the, first of all, as, as Dennis had noted, we do these not look for two variables, um, average temperature over uh, overlapping seasons and also total accumulated precipitation. So everything I'll be talking about will be in deriving these particular uh, forecast products. And uh, each month, um, these forecasts are released about the, the middle of a month or so. It depends on a uh, year and the particular month, of course. But in general, these are released on the third Thursday of each month. And there are a set of 13 outlooks for both temperature and precipitation uh, out to about a year. And the first one, for example, for the forecast that was created in December, uh, the first forecast lead, as we call it, would be for the, an average temperature and total accumulated precipitation forecast for the January, February, March season. And then the next uh, forecast lead would be February, March, and April, and so on out to about a year. Um, in, in addition to internal discussion here at CPC, we also make available discussions amongst our partners about the seasonal forecast uh, process in the sense of the review of the climate conditions that we're facing and some of the forecast tools, et cetera. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so why do we go ahead and try to do this? Um, there's a number of factors that are listed here. Um, these are the scientific forecast basis for making these outlooks. I won't have time to go into too much detail on any one of these, um, but I will focus on the first, second, and third bullets mainly. Uh, taking a look at the first bullet, um, there's natural variability in the climate system um, that is known and documented to organize the weather onto seasonal time scales. And I, it's my understanding that most folks on the call are very familiar with the El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO cycle. Uh, this is one of the primary drivers um, for our seasonal forecast because it acts on a seasonal time scale, applies over a three-month period, more than some of the other climate variability that we see. Um, we also make use very heavily of statistical forecast tools, and these are using various methods and data. But in a nutshell, these focus on uh, relationships between one variable um, and, and, and several other variables and how they relate to temperature and precipitation across the United States. We make, we make use of long-term trends mainly for temperature. Um, basically, we take the last 10 years and compare it to the long-term 30-year average. And sometimes there's a, a substantial signal there that we can utilize in our forecast process. Uh, the, first, the fourth bullet um, also mentioned, um, we also can make use of actually dynamical uh, computer models, which explicitly forecast temperature and precipitation even at these longer forecast time, uh, time and lead, uh, very often. And we have make very much use of uh, boundary conditions. Um, these include soil moisture, uh, near coast uh, ocean temperatures, and also snow cover. You can go to the next slide. 
Um, so I'm going to start touching on these. And the first slide here is uh, what we call La Nina composites. Again, I'm assuming folks are very familiar with what we mean by La Nina, so I won't spend time going on that, but we'd be happy to answer any questions if necessary later. Um, but one of the main drivers we do as a first step is that if we are in an ENSO period, uh, similar to the way we are now with during La Nina, we can, we can look back at the historical record for past La Nina events, and we can see what happened. And um, as an example here, during La Nina typically, uh, and again, these are very typical uh, impacts, uh, as we've seen this year, this particular La Nina has been anything but typical, at least in certain parts of the uh, lower 48. Uh, this would indicate that typically during La Nina, it's colder than normal across the Pacific and northwest part of the country, and generally a tendency for warmer across the southeast. And on the right is the precipitation composite, or average of these La Nina events. And you can see generally during La Nina, as has been noted before uh, already in the call, uh, tendency for drier than normal conditions. So we use this as basically a starting point, again, when we have this, the ENSO cycle active. If you can go to the next slide. At that stage, once we have that starting point, um, we, we begin to augment that by a number of things. There's a lot on this, on this slide, but I'll, I'll step through it pretty, pretty uh, slowly. Um, on the left, as I mentioned before, we have a number of empirical or statistical approaches in which we use. We have several of these. Uh, the plot on the left is mainly just to show an example. Um, these, are, again, are relating relationships between certain variables and what has been shown in the historical record to be observed across the U.S. for temperature and precipitation. Um, the numbers in this case just are, are the larger numbers indicate where the sing signal is strongest. And we tend to try to only focus on more robust signals there. And uh, we make use of three or four different techniques in this sort of method. Um, as you go to the right, um, as I mentioned, we have computer models that also simulate uh, temperature and precipitation. And there's an example of that on the right, the four maps. And these forecast models can go uh, out in advance uh, up to uh, five to nine months or so. And these are four particular overlapping seasons showing that. And one thing that we do at CPC, we use these tools individually or in itself. But we also try to combine them based on how they perform in the historical <coughs> record during certain times of the year and under certain conditions. And this will, is an objective combination of these tools that are based on how well they performed, as I mentioned. And this often, all, all, often serves as a first guess to the forecaster. Next slide, please. So I want to spend just a minute um, talking about what we, the challenges we face. I think we all will realize that seasonal forecasting is a tough business to be in, and it's a very humbling business. Um, we know that there's other forms of variability uh, in the atmosphere or ocean system that can uh, wreak havoc on a seasonal forecast, mainly because they're not predictable at longer time scales. So for instance, the Arctic Oscillation is shown here, mainly affecting temperature, um, is not, cannot be constantly predicted, the phase of it, um, at the seasonal forecast time scale. And uh, the AO, just as a quick review or uh, for people who are not aware, it's basically, in a nutshell, a sea salt pressure between the poles and the mid-latitudes. And when it's in its negative phase, um, it can more often favor cold air outbreaks across parts of the United States. And when it's in its positive phase, it tends to be warmer. Uh, we've been in uh, the positive phase much of this particular winter. And that's shown in the upper right plot, where it's a combination of during La Nina events when we have a positive AO. This is the temperature sign signature you would see. The middle plot shows um, what our forecast have been looking like for the last several months, um, which is during uh, consistent or steady La Nina conditions. This is what we would normally expect. And then, of course, similar to what we had last year, uh, negative AO, very cold across parts of the central and eastern United States. So this is one of the wild cards that plays havoc with our forecast. There's others, but this is, I'll move on to the next slide, which is a quick snapshot of uh, verification. I've chosen these two examples. Um, to, to provide a spectrum of where we're at um, confidence-wise and what the level of confidence users could have. On the left is uh, verification of all of our winter time forecasts for temperature from the 1995 to 2010 period. And on the right is summer precipitation uh, for the similar time period. And uh, I want you to focus first on the contours, the black lines on both plots. And what these illustrate basically is uh, a Increase in whether we're providing an increase in value to the user based on what would normally be provided by climatology or randomly guessing any of the three, get, three categories that Dennis talked about earlier. And positive numbers are good. Uh, dashed contours and negative numbers are not good. Um, overall, for the wintertime period for temperature, uh, 
uh, large scale over this long time period. We generally do uh, the add value. Uh, we have positive numbers across much of the U.S., the largest values across parts of the southern, southwest, and southern plains, and also into the Pacific Northwest, and also um, the southern mid-Atlantic coast. Uh, we, we perform the most uh, poorly across parts of New England and the central, the Great Lakes region. For precipitation, you see a large change. You see negative, you see dashed contours indicating uh, uh, negative uh, values, which means we're not adding any value uh, to the forecast. Um, there's no inherent problems with forecasting summertime precipitation. Um, but where we do have some confidence um, in using the forecast across parts of the southern uh, U.S. and the Pacific Northwest, stretching across parts of the central uh, United States as well and across Florida. So uh, again, I show this mainly as a spectrum of ranges of how confident and how well we do in our forecast. The, con the shading is mainly, uh, in, 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 you know, basically indicates um, more often where we make a forecast. We get the green and uh, brown shades indicate we've made more forecasts for wintertime temperature than, say, on the right, where we have blue shades for summertime precipitation. So I appreciate your time. Um, my contact information is on the next slide via email. And um, I'll be happy to take any questions if necessary later on. Thank you for your time. Ali is uh, going to join us now to talk about um, some tools that Clemus has developed that uh, help you look back at, at your own regions and diagnose some of the skill things that John had. Okay. All right. Um, thanks for having me, Mark. Um, Mark asked me to talk some about um, making use of the seasonal outlook. And one of the things that first comes up is sort of the question of how good are they for a given application. And the point of my presentation is to really drive home that answering that question about how good the seasonal outlooks are, it, it's not a simple question. Uh, the answer really depends on a lot of things. Um, for each decision maker, their location is different. The seasons that matter to them may be different. And the lead times for their decision may be different. So they're looking at specific sets of uh, outlooks. And then they may have different ways of measuring the skill of a forecast and deciding whether the performance of the outlook is good enough to warrant their use for their application. Um, and there's a lot of different metrics. There's things like a hit rate or a probability of detection, false alarm rate. There's a whole string of uh, scores that can be used. Um, each one has its own strength, its unique kind of information that it conveys. I'm not going to go over each of them, uh, but I do want to make the point that um, the metrics that might be important to a forecaster or a climatologist may be quite different than the metrics that really matter for deciding whether the outlooks are good enough for a specific decision. And then what's needed is not just a, a simple statement about what, if the forecasts are good enough or bad enough or if the user should sort of go or no-go with a given outlook. But um, with these uh, pictures here, you can sort of see that maybe um, we're not just trying to provide data about climate variability. We're not just trying to provide information contained in the seasonal outlook. But we're really trying to connect the information conveyed in the outlooks with the wisdom that a decision maker has about the choices and the risks that they are willing to take. So what we're trying to do is develop the knowledge about the performance of, of the outlook. So if you can think about the picture on the left there with the dog and the skunk. The decision makers are the dog, the outlooks are the stump, and then the climate support, that is us, we're trying to help the dog develop knowledge, sort of minimize the pain and maximize the gain um, in, in making use of the outlook. Um, the results that I'm going to talk about um, are based on the use of our online forecast evaluation tool. I've got the URL here in the green box. Um, the URL uh, shows the, the um, it shows the link for the forecast evaluation tool. This tool is free, but you do need to register for the tool just so we can get a sense of um, what sort of folks are, are using the tool. So um, Mark asked me to talk about how people can make use of the Outlook. And that really prompted me, my next slide please, prompted me to develop this simple flow chart. Um, so I'm glad he sort of pushed me to put this together, uh, a flow chart for using the Outlook. And you can see that for these different boxes, uh, within the flow chart, there's different colors. And that sort of drives home that each person or group 
has sort of a different role in this process. So what you see in the uh, gray represents the decision makers and kind of where they have their um, the, the primary um, effort. And then the areas in the blue are where both the decision makers and climate support comes together to really trade information, uh, trade knowledge. And then the, the brown areas are where the climate support really provides the, the, the neat capability. So it may start here with the vulnerability assessment that the decision makers done, uh, looking at sort of their situation, what are their weak links, what are their opportunities, what sort of the worst case, best case that they can manage under different kinds of conditions. Then they take a look at the situational assessment, just like the webinars that you've been uh, attending and like what we've heard about so far this morning. Uh, so you can look at the current circumstances for climate and impact, but then the decision makers also looking at their current circumstances as far as, in so far as uh, the flexibility of their operation and what their risks might be, how much risk they may be willing to tolerate at any given time. So then we go over to is an outlook available? And that may seem like a silly question. Of course, an outlook is available. The Weather Service is very good about issuing the forecast in a reliable way month after month after month. Um, but it's not quite so uh, simple as that. Um, for short-term forecast, um, all of the tools that go into making up an outlook uh, have generally shown skill. For example, the 6 to 10 day outlook or the 8 to 14 day outlook. Uh, seasonal climate outlooks are a different, a different animal. Um, they are actually more forecast of opportunity where for some places, sometimes there's enough skill to warrant issuing an outlook. So an outlook is always issued. And what the outlooks try to convey is where uh, the tools have shown skill and then what the signal might be of the um, climate pattern. So it's a, it's a little more complicated than just saying we, we always have an outlook. And then even if you have an outlook, the, the way it shows some uh, shift in forecasted probability, that outlook may not have demonstrated enough skill in your particular area to warrant use. So in instance, you really don't have an outlook. Um, so in the, in the flow chart, let's say you do have an outlook um, that is a colored area on the map the variable you're interested in. Then the next question is, so what are, what are the relevant metrics? What metrics really matter for a specific decision? And then um, the next question is, is there sufficient skill? So let's take a look at the skill. There's a lot of different ways to measure skill. Uh, next slide, please. This comes out of our forecast evaluation tool, and it covers the 17-year history of the seasonal climate outlooks that are in their current format. Um, you can see there's quite a bit of difference depending on what outlooks you're looking at. The outlooks on the left show uh, the precipitation outlook. The ones on the right are for temperature. The top row shows outlooks issued in April, May, covering June, July, and August. Uh, and then the outlooks on the bottom were issued September, October, November, and cover the, the, the heart of the winter season, December, January, February. Um, I should say um, January, February, March. Excuse me, January, February, March. Um, so you can see there's quite a bit of difference. Uh, just to illustrate, uh, say, for the uh, outlooks that are issued in the spring, covering the summer, uh, for South Texas, the outlook has been issued only 3% of the time for that set up in that upper left-hand corner. Uh, whereas you look for uh, the, the outlooks covering the winter issued in the fall for South Texas, outlooks have been issued, but this, there's been a colored area on the map over 90% of the time. Uh, for Central Tech, Kansas, there's been outlooks over 50% of the time and so on for that. Outlooks issued in the fall covering the winter. And then you can see easily that for temperature outlooks, the situation is a lot better generally, uh, a lot more frequent uh, specification of a forecast probability uh, on the map, regardless of the season and lead time. So that's a, the that's a first cut to look at. Next one is looking at the uh, prior score. And, um, the Briar score is a nice one. There's a lot of different metrics, but the Briar score is good for decision makers that may be um, experiencing impacts of uh, climate conditions asymmetrically. That is, unseasonably warm conditions produce different levels of impacts than unseasonably cool conditions, or unseasonably wet conditions produce different kinds of impacts than unseasonably dry conditions, or the range of types of decisions they make might be different. So um, this, this shows. On the top, uh, this is all for uh, temperature outlooks. 
Popero shows, Outlook issued in April, May, covering uh, part of the summer, June, July, August. The ones on the bottom, again, are issued September, October, November, and cover the heart of the winter season. That December, January, February, it should say January, February, uh, March, DJF, JFM. Um, you can see that there's quite a bit of difference in the performance. Um, I've got different bars or um, below each map because the scale of the color range is maximized, is, is stretched out to show uh, maximum differences across the climate uh, division, the climate outlook division. So you can get a sense that there really is a difference in performance. So looking at um, the, the summer outlooks that are issued in the spring, for example, um, South Texas, the outlooks, or South Texas, the outlooks are 16% better than just using uh, climatological um, probabilities, that is, equal chances. Um, whereas in Northeast Washington, and just as a contrast, those outlooks are only 1% better than using the equal chances. And if you look at the upper Midwest, the outlooks are actually worse. When they've been issued, um, the outlooks are worse than using equal chances. So if you go back to that flow chart, it's an easy case of saying in the upper Midwest for that combination of seasons and um, lead time, even though there's a colored area on the map, you might go back and um, base your decisions on as if there was no skill. Um, right. So let's take a look at um, the next slide, which shows the forecast performance for um, precipitation. Again, these um, fire scores are shown relative to the use of the uh, equal chances. And what they're doing is looking at the uh, probability that was uh, specified for a given category. So in this case, an unseasonably wet or unseasonably dry condition. <coughs> And then taking into account um, the strength of that probability statement or the confidence of that probability statement, and then looking at whether the conditions actually fell into that category. That is, the wettest of the uh, three terse out categories that, the, uh, that are used in making the forecast, or the middle category, or the, the lowest. So here you can see that the um, performance is different for uh, precipitation than it was for temperature. I'm not going to go into all the numbers. I would point out, look at the Central California. Um, that area is black. That means in all of the 17 years, no probability shift has ever been indicated for June, July, August for the forecast issued in April and May. So they haven't had a chance to show skill or not, right? Uh, they just simply have said you see. Okay. And then looking at, uh, oops, go ahead. Yeah, there we go. Um, just to give you a couple of numbers for South Texas, you can see that the um, Outlooks that show uh, an increased chance for unseasonably wet conditions are 26, have shown to be 26% better than the use of uh, climatology covering the winter. And then uh, for the unseasonably dry category, I think 16% um, better than the just using equal chances. Now, when we look at this, now stay on this slide, you know, the question then is what's behind this poor performance in uh, summer outlooks that are issued in the spring? and then the better performance for outlooks that are uh, covering the winter that are issued in the fall. If we go to the next slide, we can see this, the, the particular outlooks that were used in computing the uh, skill scores. The x-axis shows the time, so you can see uh, 17 years worth of outlooks. The y-axis shows the strength of the outlook statement for the uh, first style that you're interested in, so it shows the uh, probability of being in the, uh, the unseasonably wet category. The size of the dot represents the lead time. We're working with short lead time. That is, um, outlooks issued in April and May, covering June, July, and August. And then the color of the dot of the circle shows what actually happened. If, if we were in that uh, unseasonably wet category, the moderate neutral category, <clears throat> or in the unseasonably dry category. Now, take a look at where all these forecasts were. They all were specifying. Uh, equal chances. There's only one that you can see out of those 17 years where there was, and it, it was in uh, 2002 where it showed a decreased probability of having uh, wet conditions, but it turned out to be wet. So in this case, I would suggest that there isn't skill in the forecast, and so you wouldn't suggest that someone actually use it, or um, precipitation outlook issued in April and May covering June, July, and August. It also shows that if you look at, say, uh, from two, 2000 to 
2001 through 2010, uh, that is a, a period that uses a constant climatological reference period, you do not see equal distribution of wet, neutral, and dry conditions. It was either, <laughs> the observations showed that it had been either uh, unseasonably wet or unseasonably dry. There were no moderate conditions for June, July, and August um, from 2001 to 2010. So, uh, compared to their, their climatological reference period that they were um, based on, that the outlooks were based on. All right, so let's take a look at um, the next figure. And this shows that for as far as southern Texas, the outlooks that were issued in the fall, that is September, October, and November, covering December, January, February, and January, February, March, part of the winter season. And you can see that the, out, the, the record looks quite a bit different, uh, that there were often outlooks that deviated from equal chances, showing either increased or decreased chances of having unseasonably wet conditions. And then you can see for all of the uh, circles that are above that 0.33 line, it, most of them are blue, meaning, meaning that unseasonably wet conditions actually happen. And for the, the circles that are down below the 0.33 line, you can see that um, they're most of them, not all of them are, but most of them are red, uh, that meaning that unseasonably dry conditions actually happen. You see a few green ones uh, that indicate that uh, un that conditions actually turned out to be in that neutral category. So this kind of figure really allows you to get a sense of uh, what's behind the skill score. Next slide. In fact, you can go and look with our forecast evaluation tool. Look at the full record of all of the forecasts and observations that have been issued for each of the climate outlook divisions. I'm not going to go through all of those, but it's, it's really interesting to take a look uh, for regions, the, the outlook divisions that might be in your region. Uh, there's quite a bit of difference. These are for the precipitation outlook, and uh, I challenge you to go take a look on the temperature outlook. They are really different. Uh, it, it's pretty informative uh, about the, the overall uh, outlook uh, performance. You can see here for central Oklahoma that uh, for a lot of times the outlooks just show EP, but on a seasonal basis, there's a little bump up in uh, the likelihood of unseasonably wet conditions. And then sometimes, but not often, a decrease in the likelihood of wet conditions. All right, let's go back to the, uh, to the flow chart. So you can see that there's a, there's a lot to look at when you're trying to answer that question about is there sufficient skill or not. And let's say you may have been in South Texas looking at uh, the precipitation and temperature outlook uh, issued in the fall covering the winter when there's ocean. The outlooks have shown skill. So you might suggest that a decision maker then prepare not just for a single possible outcome, but proportionally prepare for if the outlook turns out to be correct, if it turns out to be somewhat correct, that if conditions don't fall into the, the tercile that had the highest, to the, the category that had the highest likelihood, but the one that was close to it, like moderate conditions, or if the outlook is a bust, that is, uh, the complete opposite kind of conditions happen. So you end up with unseasonably dry, even though the outlook showed increased chances of it being unseasonably wet. You may not prepare equally. That proportional preparation depends on both the cost, the risk, the potential benefit, uh, as well as the forecast and their outlook. So let's say if there wasn't a sufficient skill, then what? Is it just that you don't have anything to offer in terms of helping someone make a decision? No. In fact, this is where it actually gets be a little more uh, effort on the part of climate support. Uh, the first thing to start with is whether local studies have been done. The national outlooks are based on uh, a limited number of tools that cover the entire, that, that have shown skills somewhere uh, on a, that they can do on a national, national basis. But local studies may show uh, some sort of skill that can't be, that isn't now embedded in the national, national product. So you may have local studies that have been done. Uh, but certainly you can assess the broad range of past conditions, whether it's uh, the historical record, or whether you've got paleoclimate studies, if you've got other kinds of studies that are available to show um, that range of variability that um, we talked about earlier when you're trying to define what is normal. So then the suggestion is for decision makers then is to prepare for all conditions. You can't really just say use equal chances because if, you, if none of the tools have shown skill, you don't have a scientific basis for establishing a probability. 
So um, in looking at uh, preparing for those conditions, um, if you go to our, the next slide, our forecast evaluation tool lets you actually look at, for a given uh, outlook division, what recent conditions have been relative to the historical climatological reference period. You can see here for South Texas, um, the, the graph on the lower left, the black line shows recent observations over the last two years relative to the 1971 to 2000 reference period divided into the three categories, that is the unseasonably uh, dry category, the moderate uh, category, and then the unseasonably wet category. And then you might do, um, pardon me? Oh, okay, and then you might take a look at. Okay, then you might take a look at the, the, the uh, right graph, uh, and then you can see some analogs. You can look at the historical record, and here we show we have some to look at each individual year from 1991 to 2000. Next, to show the next slide. Then you can look at individual years. In this case, uh, 1966, 1976, 1988, um, 1980, and so on. So then you can talk with decision makers about what specific years really had created problems for them in the past, which ones really created opportunities for them in the past. And then you may look at through some historical studies to see how often those conditions have happened, uh, or what other kinds of things were going on that helped make those sort of opportunistic times or difficult times. So we'll end up with the last, uh, the last graphic here to go back to the uh, flow chart. And I think this kind of helps work through sort of where you might focus different kinds of conversations between looking at the climate information, looking at the, uh, the seasonal outlook, looking at the skill evaluation, and then other kinds of supporting information and helping sort of making choices about uh, not just a single decision, but having a plan for some backup as well, how to mitigate some of the negative possibilities and then positioning also for positive, positive results. You get sort of um, good conditions that happen. So I think I'll just end that. Um, here we go. All right. Uh, thank you to, um, to Hallie and, and John and Dennis and, and uh, Mark and our State Farm Talks presenters. Um, I hope that this kind of gives you an idea of the challenges that uh, they all face when they're creating those seasonal products, the, the many different variables that go into effect here in, in making them, and uh, and uh, that there is there are places that they can be used in some of the tools that can help you know when they're, you can get capitalize on them and maybe when they're not, not as robust. So uh, I'd also like to thank everybody who's joined us. and um, we uh, will open up our questions and comments. Um, I don't see any up here on the on the list yet. Um, if you have anything, please uh, go ahead and do that. We'll try to address it. Uh, we'll leave the list, list of resources up here on the screen. As always, um, a lot of different resources are here, or the people listed can help you get to the, the kinds of um, kinds of uh, others that are out there, like the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, as a reminder, presentation materials will be posted to the drop portal in the Southern Plains section, uh, and the two-page summary we'll produce uh, will go out early next week, and uh, as well as being posted on the Skip YouTube page, uh, the video of this, and the summary to Facebook. Our uh, next webinar, as a reminder, will be on February 9th. Uh, we will not have one on January 26th because of the American Meteorological Society meeting and the challenges of scheduling presenters for that. Um, I think we do have uh, questions. Let's see, um, or is there anything there? Or yeah, we we um, we did try a little bit of a different um, audio connection on this, and uh, there there was a little bit of an echo. We'll try to uh, address that for for future um, for the future webinars. Uh, is there anything else in there? Absolutely. Um, okay, and. Uh, as always, we encourage you to continue to spread the word and make sure that all those dealing with aspects of this drought are part of the larger community and can access the support that they need. Uh, the, the survey that we have sent out uh, previously is still open. We're preparing a summary of that, and we hope that you will be able to um, make use of that and, and give us 
feedback to make sure that these are on, on track and providing useful information to you. Um, I see we have one other uh, uh, comment, something uh, typing here, so hold on just a second with that. Um, and uh, Um, oh, uh, question here, uh, what John Gottschalk's email is um, and the definition of uh, Arctic Oscillation. Um, uh, we, uh, Margaret's put, put John's back up there so you can contact him directly. Um, and uh, John, uh, do you want to uh, uh, take that question on Arctic Oscillation or? Yeah, yeah I, I can. Offer a brief explanation and also follow up with Alan offline with more detailed information. But to kind of keep it simple, it's basically a, a seesaw uh, between atmospheric pressure in the high, higher polar latitudes and what's observed in the mid latitudes. And this will tend to shift back and forth. And the reason it's important is that um, typically during the period when the Arctic oscillation is in its negative phase, there's a few. Uh, Typical impacts that are observed, for instance, across much of the United States is more of a frequency or tendency for cold air outbreaks, and also the storm track is more shifted to the south. When it's in its positive phase, tend, the storm track tends to be shifted further to the north, and uh, there's less likelihood for any uh, persistent large-scale cold air outbreaks to, to penetrate into the central United States. Um, I can follow up with him with more, more technical stuff if necessary. I have a few images that I can forward to him. As well as the one that's in my presentation slide, also gives uh, also some additional information as to what the Arctic, Arctic oscillation is. It, uh, I'd also mention on that I think that the Arctic oscillation, unlike um, ENSO, which which varies uh, more gradually um, on the scale of several months or years, you can see that that changing that Arctic oscillation can jump around. Um, a lot more frequently, uh, I think, on the order of, of weeks or so, if, if I have that, that correct. And, and that makes it very difficult to include in seasonal forecasts. Uh, uh, John, do I have that somewhat correct? That's correct. There's a lot of different time scales for the AO. There's a decadal, there's the time scale, there's a the, uh, monthly, and more of the seasonal as well. Uh, bottom line, it's not really visible beyond a few weeks, at least common. Hey, well, I think we, we have everything, and um, as uh, we, we always seem to run long, but there's uh, there's a lot of great discussions in, in here, and appreciate everybody hanging with us. Um, and uh, please uh, join us again on February 9th. Feel free to contact us or our presenters or, or any of our partners here at any point. And uh, we uh, hope that this winter will continue to bring some relief to the drought that we've been experiencing. And um, and, and be a lot milder than the kinds of things we saw in 2011. Thank you all and have a good day.